so to everyone, welcome. This is study group with Venerable Yuta Damoviku joining us from Thailand. We are going to study the Visuddhimagga today. We are continuing chapter one, paragraph 139. First, we are going to take the five precepts. Uh, we will need someone to lead with the precepts today. Is there anyone who would like to? Thank you, Sandra. Go ahead. Aham bande ti sarane na sahapanja si lani ya chami. Duti ambi aham bande ti sarane na sanja si lani. Tati ambi aham bande ti sarane na sanja si lani ya. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang Saranangga Chang. Buddhang Saranangga Chang. Dhammang Saranangga Chang. Dhammang Saranangga Chami. Sanghang Saranangga Chami. Sanghang Saranangga. Dutiyam pi Buddhang Saranangga Chami. Dutiyam pi Buddhang Saranangga Chami. Dutiyam pi Dhammang Saranangga Chami. ดุติยัมปิธัมมังสารนังดุติยัมปิธัมมังสารนังดุติยัมปิสังขังสารนังกัจจานิดุติยัมปิสังขังสารนังกัจจานิดุติยัมปิบุทังสารนังกัจจาน
chapter, uh, paragraph 139. Oh. It is the virtue of the arahants, etc., that should be understood as tranquilized purification because of tranquilization of all disturbance and because of purifiedness. So it is said of five kinds as consisting in limited purification and so on. Please continue. 140. In the second cantad, the meaning should be understood as the abandoning, etc., of killing living beings, etc., or this is said in the Patisamida, five kinds of virtue. One, in the case of killing living things, A, abandoning is virtue, B, abstention is virtue, C, volition is virtue, D, Restraint is virtue. E. Non transgression is virtue. Two. In the case of taking what is not given. Three. In the case of sexual misconduct. Four. In the case of false speech. Five. In the case of malicious speech. Six. In the case of harsh speech. Seven. In the case of gossip. 8. In the case of covetousness. 9. In the case of ill will. 10. In the case of wrong view. Um, we didn't finish the paragraph, but we are going to. Someone will continue uh, if you don't want to. Uh, I have a question. How is uh, uh, volition is virtue? How is volition virtue? Well, how is it not? I mean, we, you need volition for virtue. You, you don't consider volition, that doesn't have anything to do with virtue. Uh, I mean, depending on how you're defining virtue, unless you're defining it in just the simple, well, in the other ways, I guess, abstention. And there's a way of saying just abstaining is virtue, virtue, but if you don't include volition, how can you abstain? Yeah, it's the mind. It's the mind. I, I just, I'm just, okay. I think I understand. Yeah, if you don't, uh, so if you don't in include volition, then uh, it seems uh, the mind is not really fully included. So the mind, the thoughts, and all that, right? The other things are all actions in, in most ways. Well, it's, so. it's really just five different ways of looking at virtue. You can think of it as abandoning. You can think of it as abstention. Think of it as volition, or I guess there's that's the different types of virtue relate to different ones of these, but it's basically describing it in five different ways. Um, Manisha, okay, Mila. Eleven. Through renunciation in the case of loss, a abandoning is virtue, etc. Twelve. Through non ill will in the case of ill will, etc. 13, through perception of light in the case of stiffness and torpor, etc. 14, <clears throat> through non distraction, etc. Agitation, etc. 15, through definition of states, Dhamma, uncertainty. 16, through knowledge, etc. Ignorance, etc. 17, through gladdening in the case of boredom, etc. 18. So this is this is interesting. I'm oh, sorry, I thought this is this is a bunch of paragraphs in one paragraph, so maybe we can split them up. But this section is uh, I'm not even sure what this list is exactly. You have lust, ill will, and stiffness and torpor agitation. That's the four. Five, that's the five hindrances. 11 to 15 is the five hindrances. I think. And then 16, ignorance and boredom. It's interesting that it adds those two. But also like gladdening in the case of boredom. Wait, let me see. Let me look at here. 
Maybe disinterest, I guess. Maybe just boredom. That's interesting that those two are included. They're just stuck in avijja and arati. Avijja and arati, arati. Discontent, maybe discontent. Yeah, discontent is also kind of like boredom. But um, when you, it's like, of course, when you're sitting in meditation and you're just unable to sit because of discontent. The moja is happiness and delight. Uh, Mila, would you like to continue? Yes. 18. Through the first jhana and the case of the hindrances. A. Abandoning is virtue, etc. 19. Through the second jhana, etc. Applied and sustained thought, etc. 20, through the third jhana, the tra happiness, etc. 21, through the fourth jhana in the case of pleasure and pain. A, abandoning is virtue, etc. 22, through the attainment of the base consisting of boundless space in the case of perceptions of matter, perceptions of resistance, and perceptions of variety. A. Abandoning is virtue, etc. 23. Through the attainment of the base consisting of boundless consciousness in the case of the perception of the base consisting of boundless space, etc. 24. Through the attainment of the base consisting of nothingness in the case of the perception of the base consisting of boundless consciousness etc. 25. Through the attainment of the base consisting of neither perception nor non-perception, in the case of the perception of the base consisting of nothingness, etc. I have a question about 22. What does that mean, um, base consisting of boundless space, in the case of perceptions of matter, perceptions of resistance? And perceptions of variety. So, like specifically, matter, resistance, and variety. What does that mean? Those are the things that prevent you from the attainment of the base. Oh no, sorry. Those are the things that are abandoned um, with the attainment of boundless space. One of the immaterial jhanas. Yeah, it's when you abandon the uh, the physical object of the. Of the of the rupa jhanas, when you abandon the rupa, I'm not quite sure what resistance refers to, but variety is uh, still interesting that those those two are included. Some sort of theory thing about what relates to what you're letting go of when you attain the rupa jhanas. Thank you. Atiga Sanya, diversity. I don't know why those relate to the Arupa jhanas only. Patiga is not a resistance. Well, I guess it kind of is, but Patiga is aversion. I guess it's not referring to that here. Interesting. It's strange after the uh, fourth jhana to have uh, Patiga. Not possible, at least. I think um, it's, it says in the commentary, it looks like this will be explained in the section. Maybe those other two will be explained in the section on the uh, Arupa Janus, which is later on. Sure. Another thing that's interesting about this is these, this, this shows that virtue isn't considered just keeping of precepts. It's not just about keeping precepts or, or livelihood or anything like that. Uh, sila is a part of meditation practice. 
So this is summit to this, this paragraph is on summit to the next paragraph will be on Vipassana. We have to remember that sila is involved in the practice of meditation. Sila is involved every time you abstain from the, the things that um, get in the way of the practice that you do. So with samatha practice, you abstain from the five hindrances. With vipassana practice, you abstain from uh, proliferation or conceptual thought. And you, you, you discard the extrapolation of things. And this is the sila. This is going on during meditation practice. It's not just about the fact that you're not killing and stealing. You can think of sila as whatever you're doing, the sila is what allows you to focus on it when you abstain and, and discard the things that get in the way. Rajesh, uh, you, sh you should be reading 26. Through the contemplation of destruction in the case of perception of compactness, A. Abandoning is virtue. 34. Through the contemplation of fall of formations, in the case of accumulating karma. 35. Through the contemplation of change, in the case of the perception of lastingness. 36. Through the contemplation of the sing signless, in the case of a sign. 37 through the contemplation of the desireless in the case of desire. 38. Through the contemplation of voidness in the case of misinterpreting insistence. 39. Through insight into states that is higher understanding in the case of misinterpreting insistence due to grasping. 40 through correct knowledge and vision in the case of misinterpreting insistence due to confusion. 49, 41, through the contemplation of danger in the case of misinterpreting insistence due to reliance on formations. 42, through reflection in the case of non-reflection. 43, through the contemplation of turning away in the case of misinterpreting insistence due to bondage. 44. Through the path of extreme entry in the case of defilements, coefficient with false view. A. Abandoning is virtue. 45. Through the path of one's return in the case of gross defilements. 46. Through the path of non-return in the case of residual defilement. 47. Through the path of arahanship in the case of all defilements. A. Abandoning is virtue. B. Abstention is virtue. C. Volition is virtue. D. Restraint is virtue. E. Non-transgression is virtue. Such virtues lead to non-remorse in the mind, to gladdening, to happiness, to tranquility, to joy, to repetition, to development, to cultivation, to embellishment, to the requisite for concentration, to the equipment of concentration, to fulfillment, to complete dispassion, to fading away, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. I have a question about 33.36. Um, what is, uh, in the case of a sign, and contemplation of signless, what do they mean by a sign? Those are referring to the three gateways to, to Nibbana. Um, in, in the case of a sign here, it's referring to a warning or a an indicator, and it it the the reason it's used is it's it's 
describing the experience of being uh, caught off guard by change, like the, the uh, experiencing or um, perceiving or observing that things change without warning, without sign. It's a cause for letting go based on impermanence. So, so it's a, a, a term that is used to describe the realization of impermanence. So it's like letting go of um, looking for signs, of just letting it be like in the present, like not anticipating and looking for indicators? Mm, well, not exactly. It's about letting go of things because you realize that the, they're not dependable. You, you'll never be, you'll never be able to predict whether they will last or how long they will last. So it leads you to let go of things that you thought were permanent or stable. Bante. Thank you, Bante. And how is this practice done, like through the contemplation of desireless in the case of the ones? From and desirelessness Sorry. relates to the observation dukkha 141 and here there is no state <clears throat> called abandoning other than then the mere non-arising of the killing of li living things etc as stated but the abandoning of a given unprofitable state upholds a given profitable state in the sense of providing a foundation for it and concentrates it by preventing wavering, so it is called virtue, sila, in the sense of composing silana, rec reckoned as upholding and concentrating as stated earlier, paragraph 19. The other four things mentioned refer to the presence of occurrence of will as ab abstention from such and such, as restraint of such and such, as the volition associated with both of these, and as non-transgression in one who does not transgress such and such. But their meaning of virtue has been explained already. So it is of five kinds, as virtue consisting in ab abandoning and so on. One for two. At this point, the answers to the questions, what is virtue? In what sense is virtue? What are its characteristics? Characteristic, function, manifestation, and proximate cause. What are the benefits of virtue? How many kinds of virtue are there? Are complete. However, it was also asked, what is the defi defiling of it? And what is the cleansing of it? We answer that virtue's wholeness, etc., is its defiling. And that its untoldness, etc., it is cleansing. Is its cleansing. Now that tornus, etc., are comprised under the breach that that has gain, fame, etc., as its cause, and under the seven bonds of sexuality. When a man has broken the training course at the beginning or at the end in any sense of the seven classes of offenses, his virtue is called torn like a cloth that is cut at the edge, but when he has broken it in the middle, it is called rent, like a cloth that, that is rent in the middle. When he has broken it twice or thrice in succession, it is called blotch, like a cow whose body is some such color as black or red with a Descriptant color appear, appearing on the back or the belly. When he has broken it all over at intervals, it is called mortal, like a cow speckle all over with 
discrepant colored spots at intervals. This is in the first place is how there comes to be tornus with, uh, with the breach that has, that has gained, etc. as its course. And likewise with the seven bonds of sexuality, for this is said by the Blessed One. Here Brahman, some ascetic or Brahman claims to lead the life of purity rightly, for he does not enter into actual sexual intercourse with women. Yet he agrees to massage, manipulation, bathing, and rubbing down by women. He enjoys it, desires it, and takes satisfaction in it. This is what is torn, rent, blotched, and modeled in one who leads the life of purity. This man is said to lead a life of purity that is unclean. As one who is bound by the bond of sexuality, he will not be released from birth, aging, and death. He will not be released from suffering, I say. 45. Furthermore, Brahman, uh, da, 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 while he does not agree to these things, yet he jokes, plays, and amuses himself with women. Da, da, da. 146. Furthermore, Brahman, Da, 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 while he does not agree to these things, that he gazes and stares at women eye to eye. 147. Furthermore, Brahman, while he does not agree to these things, yet he listens to the sound of women through a wall or through a fence as they laugh or talk or sing or weep. 148. Furthermore, Brahman, while he does not agree to these things, yet he uh, recalls laughs and talks and games that he formerly had with women. 149. Furthermore, Brahman, while he does not agree to these things, yet he sees a householder or a householder's son possessed of, endowed with, and indulging in the five cords of sense, desire, etc. Furthermore, Brahman, while he does not agree to these things, Yet he leads the life of purity, aspiring to do some to some order of deities, thinking through this rite, virtue, or this ritual vow, or through asceticism, I shall become a great deity or some lesser deity. He enjoys it, desires it, and takes satisfaction in it. This Brahman is what is torn, rent, blotched, and mottled in one who leads the life of purity. This man, etc., will not be released from suffering, I say. This is how tornness, etc., should be understood as included under the breach that is gain, etc., as its cause under the seven bonds of sexuality. 51. Untornness, however, is accomplished by the complete non breaking of the training precepts, by making amends for those broken for which amends should be made, by the absence of the seven bonds of sexuality, and as well by the non-rising of such evil things as anger, enmity, contempt, domineering, envy, avarice, deceit, fraud, obduracy, presumption, pride, conceit, haughtiness, conceit, vanity, and negligence, and by the arising of such qualities as fewer of wishes, contentment, and effacement. Uh, nobody has any questions. Uh, Carson, you're next. Right. Virtues not broken for the purpose of gain, etc., and rectified by making amends after being broken by the fault of negligence, etc., and not damaged by the bonds of sexuality and by such evil things as anger and enmity, are called entirely untorn, unrent, unblotched, and unmodeled. And those same virtues are liberating, since they bring about the state of a free man and praised by the wise, since it is by the wise that they are praised and unadhered to, since they are not adhered to by means of craving and views and conducive to concentration, since they conduce to access concentration or to absorption concentration, that is why their untornness, etc., should be understood as cleansing. See also Chapter 7, 101. What does it mean 
making rectified by making amends after by confessing the offense and in the lay life no this just refers to monks in lay in lay life it could be the uh, retaking of the precepts so if you break one of the precepts um i think at jam tong when people broke the precepts they would they were supposed to take the precepts again and uh, meditators at Chom Tong would take the precepts every every day before the holiday, the night before the holiday. They, I think they do it here as well. I had a meditator today who confessed to eating in the afternoon because they were upset or they were uh, sad or something. I can't remember. They ate in the afternoon. But virtues refer to the so the word virtue here is a, is a translation of sila. So every time you see virtue here, you have to remember we're talking about sila. Just how he translates it in this text. Thank you. <laughs> 153. This cleansing comes about in two ways. Through seeing the danger of failure in virtue and through seeing the benefit of perfected virtue. So in the danger of virtue in virtue um, herein the danger of failure in virtue can be seen in accordance with such suttas as that beginning in quotes because there are these five dangers for the unvirtuous in the failure of which virtue 154 furthermore on account of his unvirtuousness an unvirtuous person is displeasing to deities and human beings, is uninstructable by his fellows in the life of purity, suffers when unvirtuousness is censured, and is remorseful when the virtuous are praised. Um, owing to that unvirtuousness, he is as ugly as hemp cloth. Contact with him is painful because those who fall in with his views are brought to long lasting suffering in the state of loss. He is worthless because he causes no great fruit to accrue to those who give him gifts. He is as hard to purify as a cesspit many years old. He is like a log from a pyre. He is like a log from a pyre, for he is outside both reclusion and the lay state. Through claiming the bhikkhu state, he is no bhikkhu, so he is like a donkey following a herd of cattle. He is always nervous like a man who is everyone's enemy he is an unfit he is as unfit to live with as a dead carcass through he through he may have the qualities of learning etc he is as unfit for the homage of his fellows in the life of purity as a charnel ground fire is for that of brahmans he is as incapable of reaching the distinction of attainment as a blind man is of seeing a visible object. He is as careless of the good law as a gutter snipe is of a kingdom. Through he fancies he through he fancies he is happy. Yet he suffers because he reaps suffering as told in the discourse of the mass of fire. It's a great paragraph. Uh, but the, this is talking about a bhikkhu or in general on virtuousness? Well, everything here is going to be aimed, aimed explicitly at monks. Mm. So you have to extrapolate it to lay people as well. I mean, everything is going to be in some way applicable. Most things are going to be in some way applicable to lay people. Please. 
Jolie. 155. Now the Blessed One has shown that when the unvirtuous have their minds captured by pleasure and sad in the indulgence of the five cords of sense desires, in receiving salutation, in being honored, etc., the result of that kama, directly visible in all ways, is very violent pain with that kama, its condition, capable of producing a gush of hot blood by causing agony of heart with the mere recollection of it. Here is the text. Ikus, do you see that mass of fire burning, blazing, and glowing? Yes, venerable sir. What do you think, Bikus? Which is better, that one, gone forth, should sit down or lay down, embracing that mass of fire burning, blazing, and glowing, or that he should sit down or lie down, embracing a warrior noble maiden, or a Brahmin maiden, or a maiden of householder family with soft, delicate hands and feet? It would be better, venerable sir, that he should sit down or lie down, embracing a warrior noble maiden. It would be painful, venerable sir, if he sat down or lay down, embracing that great mass of fire burning, blazing, and glowing. And fifty-six. I say to you, Bikus, I declare to you, Bikus, that it would be better for one gone forth who is unvirtuous, who is evil-natured, of unclean and suspect habits, secretive of his acts, who is not an ascetic and claims to be one, who does not lead the life of purity and claims to do so, who is rotten within, lecherous and full of corruption, to sit down or lie down embracing that great mass of fire burning, blazing and glowing. Why is that? By his doing so, because he might come to death or deadly suffering, Yet he would not on that account, in the breakup of the body after death, reappear in states of loss, in an unhappy destiny, in perdition, in hell. But if one who is unvirtuous, evil-natured, and full of corruption, would sit down or lie down embracing a warrior noble maiden, that would be long for his harm and suffering. On the breakup of the body after death, he would reappear in states of loss, in an unhappy destiny, in perdition, in hell. So if if you are a bhikkhu, basically, I mean, this is this is pretty tough. <laughs> so it's worse, it's worse to have, uh, I guess, uh, Relationship relationships with the with the woman than um, dying in fire. Well, I think the the um, the meaning there is because of the um, the deception, the uh, breach of the contract sort of because of the state of being a monk receiving food from people out of faith i mean you have to be careful it's not really fair to say that if a monk breaks this rule or that rule that they're suddenly going to hell or something because they've because they've broken the rule, but to the extent that they break rules, uh, they, 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 as he says, blot, they, their virtue becomes blotched or mottled. 
And so it's sort of a matter of degree. But if it gets to the point where they lie down and or where they, I guess the point is to have, have sex with the woman. And I guess it doesn't say sex, does it? Embracing. Embrace. Yeah. So that's a pretty, pretty significant rule breach. And that's a pretty significant breach of your livelihood. But it's, I mean, both both of them are unvirtuous and evil natured, so. Both of what? Why? Both, both, in both cases, it says both of them are unvirtuous and evil natured bhikkhu, I guess. But one is, one can go even to heaven. Oh, but the only difference is that one one of them may be embracing a woman. It's weird. Well, experiencing pain isn't a cause. Suffering isn't a cause for suffering. Unwholesomeness is a cause for suffering. So, if you do something that makes you suffer a lot, that's not a, that's not necessarily uh, going to result in more suffering in the future. Whereas if you do something very unwholesome, like living as a monk, to behave so poorly, big deal. And, and I, I think after this discourse was given, I, I don't know if this would be in the discourse or the commentary, but I believe it was said that you know there, there were some monks who had broken major rules and they became very sick and started vomiting up blood. But then there were other monks who had only broken minor rules and they had disrobed and went back to the household life. And I, I think it was implied that you know, the, the ones who you know had only broken the minor rules, they, they were still able to atone for it and go back to the, the household life. And it was you know the, the ones who had broken the, the major rules who were really um, in, in trouble because of it. So I I think like uh, Bonte saying, it's not necessarily that it's that having relations with the woman. It's because they're monks and still doing it. If just you break minor rules, you don't have to atone for it by disrobing. You have to atone for it by confessing. And in some cases, depending how serious it was, you might have to do something else. Usually it's just confessing. And if you take... Um, we take a similar rule, probably an even more glaring example is the use of money. Um, I mean, it's, it's not on the same level. Use of money is a pretty trivial thing, but a lot of monks use money. And in some ways, it um, it's not that it's unethical, but it it still has something glaringly wrong about it because of how it uh, breaks it, it dis disrupts the very nature of of the monastic life. Uh, you see monks buying food for themselves. Another one is the storing food. Uh, it's remarkable how how big of an impact it is when you don't store food. We go on alms round every morning and we get so much food sometimes and if only you were able to store food you could you could always have whatever you wanted. But no matter how much good food you get, you can only eat so much of it, and then you have to give it all away, and who knows what you're going to get the next day. Um, so what I mean to say is that the, the nature of the monk life is breached by many of these things. It's just, obviously, it's a, it's a major breach to have uh, intimate relations with, the, with another person. It's kind of forfeits the whole purpose of life. Mahasi Sayada discusses the idea of a monk who has committed a parajika, a monk who is, well, there's no such thing as a monk who's committed, but someone who has committed a parajika uh, uh, when they were a monk and is, is immediately uh, no longer a monk. And he talks about how they can they can still ordain as a novice. They can never ordain as a monk again, but they can still ordain as a novice. And um, he talks about, I think, how they could become enlightened. It's the question of whether they could still attain enlightenment. And the idea is as long as they disrobe, they can. And they could even ordain again as a novice. Uh, uh, 
It's very, very interesting. I've, I've never heard that before. So when he talks about um, it leading to hell, it's it's not, um, it's obviously not a, a doom. He's just trying to uh, scare the monks, basically, pointing out that it certainly can lead to hell. Well, it's because all the monks is a kind of a representative, right, for, for the Buddha, the whole Dhamma. Well, I don't know if that's fair to say. I'm guessing in some sense, but like many it, monks are just just trying to trying to do trying their best and working on themselves. Yeah, I, I mean, I get what you're saying. That's you're right in a way, for sure. I don't, maybe not representative. Um, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe representative. The robe is representative, and you kind of you mean you honor the you know, the robe, and you honor the station of being a monk. Okay, I think we are going to stop here. Yeah. We will be continuing with hundred and fifty-seven next time. Does anyone have a question about what we just read? I think that needs to be clarified, maybe. I think uh, if I remember right, uh, if a monk uh, is uh, having relationships and still pretending to be a monk, uh, not only it uh, blocks uh, enlightenment, uh, but it also blocks the uh, path to hell. Uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly what the language is, but it seems to me it would not just block heaven, it would be pretty pretty hard to avoid hell or the lower states if you're still pretending to be a monk and you know you've broken one of the points on chicken. Yeah, you might be right. It might just literally block heaven. I don't make sense. Hard to imagine them do it. Certainly heaven. I mean, um, you're talking about you're talking about paradjika, and I thought that those are like killing your parents and creating a schism and wounding an arahant or wounding the. No, dog. those are different. All right. So, what kind of? We don't talk about them with lay people. Oh. I don't know if we do or not, but I, I think we don't. I guess that's not quite fair. You can look them up yourself. We're not supposed to teach um, Vinaya to lay people. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's an odd sort of topic, but there's something about that. The thing is, the first thing you teach someone after they ordain, I guess that doesn't mean anything, but it's uh, the first thing that you're taught as soon as you become a monk, what are these four things? And I guess from the sounds of what we just read is uh, having sexual relations uh, is one of them. Right. You cannot answer. <laughs> yeah, there are four. The first one is uh, sexual relationship. Second one is stealing. Uh, the, it has to be a certain amount, minimum amount. Uh, third one is uh, killing human, uh, killing a human being. Fourth is uh, pretending to be enlightened or wow. pretending that uh, you have some Jani is when you know that you don't. That's also... Mm -hmm. Thank you, Santa. So maybe, I mean, there, there's, I think, uh, stealing one is tricky. So if, uh, like, monks bring something valuable uh, without paying taxes, if, if this is the law, maybe that one is a something that could affect uh... so isn't in the end uh, about the quality of the mind i mean for for um bhikkhus and for lay people as well only the because they took some uh, or they made some promises 
Uh, and that's why it's that consequent. Well, it's just that there's 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 com um, complicating factors. Like if a lay person has in romantic or in intimate relations, it's not necessarily not likely going to lead them to hell, right? But because monks have taken precepts and vows and so on, to go against that life has a stronger weight on their their mind. And then there are there are things that are completely un completely unrelated to ethics, like the use of money or storing food, and yet they also have at least some consequences when monks do them. I would think they're 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 maybe more severe than most people realize. I mean, you see monk monks, some monks do store food, and it just strikes me as something something so simple, but unfortunate like you look at it and say well that's not unethical but it's just such a shame for monks to do that because it kind of breaks the whole the whole purpose and monks using money it kind of breaks the system i mean it doesn't it it it, it only breaks it if you're if you look at it that way because so many monks use money and they're still mon monasteries are still surviving but it's just it changes the whole form of things. One thing, like money, is an example of, of how it um, really changes the format. Is lay people lose um, their 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 involvement with the monastery. Monks, when monks use money, monks do so much more of the organizing and maintaining of the monastery. And so lay people are not at all involved. When you, when I stopped using money, I noticed how how much more involved lay people become with the, with my work with, um, with what I do. And so and they're they're happy to be involved. Like they're they if there's a part they're a part to it. They're a part of it. So just noticing how it changes the system, noticing how it disrupts the the efficacy and monastic life. Because I'm not saying that if you use money or keep food, keep food overnight, store food, it's not like you're going to go to hell, but it it has a greater impact, I think, than people realize because of, because you think it's so trivial, it's not unethical to do these things. And yet when monks do them, it's such a disruption to the monastic life that it's got to have some outsized consequences. It's that kind of thing, but the difference for monks is the sort of thing that they have uh, they have the capacity to to destroy the monastic life, destroy the institution by doing things that are not even unethical. Some people might argue Monty, that those are minor rules, and maybe Buddha would have allowed to change them as he said to Venerable Ananda, but didn't specify. So those people would be wrong, first of all. Uh, yeah. And second of all, I, I'm laying out the argument for these ones in particular, because I think there are some rules that you could argue that for more convincingly, like um, digging in the dirt or breaking plant life or um, that sort of thing lighting a fire there's a, there's a lot of rules that are that's what um yeah there's a lot of rules that are i think you could easily do away with without much consequence maybe the digging in the dirt one has some consequence because it would lead potentially to farming it probably would lead to farming so that is dangerous but i mean mostly all the rules are pretty good the way they are um, but why they would be wrong, this was um, when I stopped using money, it came up against me at the monastery where I was. I'm pretty sure it was again. I mean, it was it was quite sort of roundabout, but still very much directed, I think, towards me. Because in front of all the monks at the monastery, like 50 monks or something, they brought up and explained this, that right before the Buddha passed away, he allowed 
the monks if they wanted that after he passed they could abandon the lesser and minor rules. And this monk said that that this was this is this was the Buddha said right before he passed away, and so it was his last word on the subject. And it's true that where he said or he had said earlier that we're supposed to keep all the rules, um, even seeing danger in the in the smallest fault. But that was earlier, and we have to stick to his last word on the subject. And so that was the logic by which this monk, and he was a high, he was one of the top scholar monks, and or at the, he's at the top level of scholasticism in Thailand. And so that's why he was the one who said it. But he was wrong. I mean, he was his logic was flawed. I mean, what he said was, I guess, true, but it wasn't the important point. The important point is twofold. A, um, the, what the Buddha said, want. And at the first Buddhist council, they decided they didn't want. And that has been upheld to the present day. I have never heard of anyone holding a council and saying, yes, we are we are going to go against the first Buddhist council and we are going to we're going to say that these are the lesser and minor rules, this and this and this, this set of rules, and we're going to abandon those. I don't think anyone in the history of Buddhism has done that. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. So they would have to repeat what was done at the first council and change the decision, which is hold a sangha kama to an act of the sangha in the same way they did at the first council. But the second thing is that the commentary to this Mahaparinibbana Sutta says the Buddha knew that they wouldn't. And him giving that allowance, I mean, the commentary says clear as day that the Buddha knew that they would not, out of respect for the Buddha, they would certainly not abandon any of the training precepts. And he didn't say it for the purpose of effecting an abandoning of the precepts. He said it in order to strengthen the confidence of the monks and the confidence of people in the monks that they were not doing it. Um, they were not keeping the rules simply because they had to, that they were doing it because they wanted to, that, that these were the rules that they wanted to keep and they were doing it um, voluntarily. It wasn't just begrudgingly, oh, well, this dead guy made us keep these rules. No, the Buddha gave us these rules as a gift and we're keeping them voluntarily. That's, I mean, it's, when you read the commentary, you just, it hits you with how, the meaning of that statement is totally misunderstood. And and absolutely the commentary got it right on, spot on. Yeah, what what initiated the first Buddhist council was a monk saying, oh, now the great uh, Samana has passed away. Now we are free. We can do whatever we like. I think there was a monk who said like that. That's right, yeah. So and, and also, if I remember right, uh, Venerable Ananda was uh, blamed for not asking specifics of what rules are to be uh, can be changed. Yes. What rules are the Kudano uh, Kudaka? He said, I didn't, I didn't ask. This, is, this sounds very serious in the case of, uh, for example, Zen monks who are married, or I mean, there are. I I think uh, I remember even Tibetans or something. So basically, monks who are. Pretending no, I don't know. I don't think with Tibetans. Uh, Tibetans just have many people that are not monks that appear to be monks. I mean, they look to us. I think as monks, or I'm not really sure. Lama, I think, just means teacher thing oh. i don't remember they have, they have different there's teacher and then there's monk uh no lama is monk i think and rinpoche is, is just teacher so some people you think they're monks but they're actually just teachers uh, but in zen the other thing about zen is it's just a word right and there are many different kinds of people practicing zen so in some places i think they're more consider themselves to be priests and what we would call monks 
the ones who get married. And I know lay people who, lay Zen Buddhists who wear robes and perform ceremonies, but they only wear the robes sometimes and they don't shave their heads. So those not those are not monks, basically, then? I don't know. I don't know what but they I, call themselves. I, but, yeah, I, I think generally they they accept they 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 acknowledge that they are something different, They're not monks like we are, but they are ordained as something. It just means they had a ceremony to get them the status. I think if I remember right, the, in a sutta, a Buddha named such people as the use of dhamma. I don't know. Appear there, they are appearing as monks, but they are not monks. Well, I don't think, I mean, they don't appear very much. They wear black robes, and it's not really a robe. It's not monks, or it's more like a bathrobe or a kimono or something. I don't I don't know exactly what the edit is referring to, but some Zen people don't look anything like monks in Thailand, Sri Lanka. But if someone came to Thailand and put on a Buddhist monk robe, it's interesting. I thought you couldn't wear the robes at all, but there's monks here. Uh, sorry, when people ordain here, before they become monks, I was trying to figure out how to get Chris to to practice putting on robes. And I asked them, how do they do it? And during the ordination, we were sitting waiting, and I asked him how they do it. And he said, oh, we have practice robes, some kind of old used robes. And they allow them to practice with them, which I was surprised by. I thought that was a taboo. It might be, but this monk certainly here at Wat Lambung, they become pragmatic about it. And they let them put on the robes as practice. I thought that was just forbidden. I mean, it's dangerous because that's the just one step away from pretending to be a monk, right? Yeah, and also yeah. if those robes are given to offered by lay people to a monk and giving that to, uh, to a lay person to practice that. Well, that they're not that giving. Idea. They're not giving them. They're, they're letting. Them. I don't know. I don't. I. I don't. Can't think of any rule against uh, a lay person or, or letting a lay person put your robe on or something like that. And yeah, it could be. I don't think the rules are that. Uh, sorry, the robes are that. They've just come to be so much more ceremonial and, and meaningful. And I don't, I, I, have, I don't really have an authoritative statement on this, but I, I, I'm okay with letting them practice on the robes. I mean, it's clear that because the point is the, the the real line is when they pretend, and if you're just practicing, you're not pretending. You're learning a skill, which is how to put the robe on, which unfortunately is is very necessary because of the way we wear the robes here. I showed Chris how you wear how we wear robes in Sri Lanka, and he was like, "So, <laughs> Sri Lanka, huh? It's, uh, it's, Sri Lanka's looking good." Today, he finally, this morning, he finally came with me on alms round, and his robe almost fell off. Is it the style where you reveal one a shoulder bunte or cover all around? <laughs> cover both. I mean, that was the same in Sri Lanka as well, so that wouldn't have been as useful, but. You know, there's a there's a special way of wearing your robes where you fold it in pleats and then you tie it up so you tie a, you know, tie it around your your chest. The upside is it stays on. If you if you do it right, it stays on and you never have to adjust it throughout the day. Wonder again about the rules um, of not storing food and not using money. Weren't they um meant to keep the community of the lay people and the monks close together in the sense that the monks in a way have to prove themselves worthy of receiving the food and the lay people to keep close to the Dhamma teachings. I mean, I think it's a little more... Um vague than that the buddha was remember the buddha was was perfect and so he knew what a monastic life should be like he had a clear vision of what monastic life would be like and 
he didn't ever have to think, oh, this rule is for this or that rule is for that. He would just say, you know, it's it's clearly wrong for monks to use money. It's clearly wrong for monks to store food in a way that's not clear to uh, to to most of us. Many of the rules are not clear until you've lived as a monk and you've 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 kept the rules. If you don't ever keep the rules, it's not really clear the the benefit of keeping them. Even then, it's, because we're not the Buddha, that's why in the earlier on, we remember where it said the the precepts are kept out of faith because you don't know you don't know what the rules should be. Even the five precepts in the beginning, people keep them out of faith until they realize how dangerous it is to try and break. To, uh, dangerous it is to break them. Dangerous it is to break them. How harmful it is to break. Them. So you don't have to go about explaining them. There's many. There can be many reasons, and there can be many factors. It's just clear just to to a to a Buddha. Uh, so money is not appropriate for monastics, and you can describe the ways in which it causes problems. But that's not the reason why. That's not usually necessarily the reason. So we can we can wonder, you know, like for the digging in the earth, why why is that important? Buddha knew it was important, but why is it important? He didn't always say why it's he didn't usually say why it's important. Sometimes it's glaringly obvious, but in digging in the earth, I think sometimes he did say sort of a reason. But usually it was the the story behind it that helps hint at the reason or some of the reason. Like I would bet that digging in the earth would have a surprising negative effect if we if we just said we're no longer keeping it. But as I said, monks would start farming. And that might seem innocuous, but that would be a big deal. If monks started farming, well, then they would start breaking other rules and keeping food and pesticides, even now maybe not, but possibly pesticides. It would be a bit disastrous, more so than you might think. Um, Bhante, are you allowed to say um, in the situation where the the community of monks digging in the earth, the monk is uh, maybe like a novice or or learning like a new newer monk? Um, what would they do in that circumstance? They're not they're newer, and then the community they. They see what's happening and they know it's not right. Do they do they have to go along with Is that in those circumstances? Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. Breaking these minor rules is not a big deal. It's um, it's not the most important thing. Chris, we're talking about this with Chris and with the money thing, and he said, well. It was discouraging, and he did he say something about, you know, couldn't shouldn't we try to say something or try to change people's mind? I said, so I, what I said was to him was it seems like a, a waste of energy, or not a waste of energy, not a waste, but a a misallocation of energy. You're going to spend your energy on that. You're just that energy would be better spent uh, related to meditation activities, teaching meditation, and so. Um, so, like, sure, there are reasons to encourage the keeping of rules, but uh, it's not the end of the world if people are doing that sort of thing. I think um, for new monks, you don't worry, you don't stress or uh, worry about breaking rules. You try to keep them, and when you break them, you confess them, and you spend years learning how to not break them. I think by my fifth year as a monk, I was no longer using money. I was no longer drinking soy milk in the evening, which was a big thing. I was no longer, I was no longer storing food. In the very beginning of it's funny the sorts of rules that I broke because everyone broke them. Like I would keep soy milk overnight. These these tetra packs of soy milk and. Ovaltine and different drinks, fruit juice sometimes, because it seemed like a good thing to do. Then I could have some every day, and if one day I got some and I didn't get some the next day, well, I could store them, and then I could always have some. 
And uh, when it just dawned on me that this was breaking a rule, it was like, oh, what a what a change of lifestyle this is going to have to be where some days I won't get something to drink in the evening. And then furthermore, when I started to realize, hey, wait, even soy milk in the evening, that's breaking another rule. And realizing I would never be able to have soy milk in the evening ever again. So it was just a, over years slowly keeping it, especially because people around me weren't always keeping it. Did, did Buddha talk about the importance of um, the community of lay people and monastics to have uh, a link to keep those, to interact? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess he didn't spend a lot of time on it, but he said that the lay people are great benefit to the monks and the monks are of great benefit to the lay people. I mean, I think there's some talk, some places about, I mean, it's pretty obvious the importance of being working together. These are the kind of things that you, you see the difference when you practice in different ways. So having money and then not kept money, having kept food and not kept food, you notice the difference for yourself and as I said the difference in how it how you relate to to lay people. See monks are have gotten very self-reliant, but but self-reliant in one sense and on the other in the other sense very much reliant on lay people as almost like customers. So the monks begin to find ways to encourage monetary donations. They don't have big ceremonies and big events and so on, but designed to appeal to people who have money. It's not that dire, but in some cases it certainly is. There's certainly that aspect. Of the whole dynamic shifts when monks get involved with money. The whole thrust of the lifestyle, and then monks start having, uh, having titles and jobs and salaries changes things most importantly i mean it's it, it it's such a challenge and such a support for letting